ahead and get started. We'll get started. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Phibbs, Director of Education for the Office for Equity and Diversity. And welcome to Unmasking Choice, moving from reproductive rights to reproductive justice, our sixth conversation in this year's Critical Conversations about Diversity and Justice series. The Critical Conversation series is co-sponsored by the University Libraries. The libraries have developed a list of further academic resources on each of our Critical Conversation topics, which you can link to on our Critical Conversations webpage. We continue to offer live streaming of our conversations so that you can watch via our website in real time or at a later date since they'll be archived on that website, that web page. We've also added an opportunity for you to provide feedback on this series. If you signed in, we'll email a link to an online evaluation or you can access the link on the web page. And as with all of our conversations, we'll start with some discussion among our moderator and panelists and then move out to the audience for Q&A. So now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's conversation, Heather Liu. Heather C. Liu, she, her, hers, is an angry Gemini, earth dragon, multiracial, Asian, queer, cisgender, woman of color, artist and educator based in Minneapolis. Heather works here at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities as the assistant director of the Multicultural Center for Academic Excellence. Heather's practice focuses on radical transformation and liberation, rooted in womanism and gender equity through a racialized borderland lens. She has served as the NASPA Asian Pacific Islander Knowledge Community Outreach Co-Coordinator, ACPA Multiracial Network Chair, ACPA Coalition for Multicultural Affairs Advocacy Coordinator, as well as on the NASPA Bias Protocol Development Working Group, ACPA Leadership Pipelines Working Group, and ACPA Equity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Heather was the 2016 NASPA Region 6 Dorothy Keller Outstanding New Professional Awardee and will be receiving the ACPA Annuit Keptis Emerging Professional Award, Coalition for Women's Identities Mid-Level Professional Award, and Coalition for Graduate Students and New Professionals Outstanding Mentor to New Professionals Award in 2017. In her spare time, how does she have any spare time? Uh, <laughs> Heather loves creating art, ogling at puppies, playing with Olive Bear, her cat, making glitter mason jar snow globes for self-care, playing her ukulele and spending time with her loving partner. Please welcome Heather Liu. Well, of course, technology, we did it. Our first, our first technology moment of the day. Thank you so much for joining us, y'all. Once again, my name is Heather. Yes, I do have spare time, and um, clearly it's all with oogling at puppies. Um, but, you know, uh, today we're here to talk about some really important uh, conversation with some wonderful panelists um, around moving from reproductive rights to reproductive justice. And just to frame some of the conversation, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what today's conversation will be and also set us in the context of being here in, uh, in Minnesota, in the Twin Cities. And then um, I'll introduce our wonderful panelists and then we'll get right into the dialogue. And so as we continue, if you all have any questions or need any clarification feel free to write that down or just raise your hand and let us know um, we will be saving about 20 or 30 minutes at the very end for us to actually have a more in-depth conversation as a community so just know that there will be that opportunity all right Cool. So um, I want to start today's conversation just recognizing that we are on colonized Dakota land and that we are here um, as a manifestation also of violence, right, of sterilization, of colonization, right, and traditionally on land of in the indigenous peoples of Minnesota. Um, and that's a reproductive justice issue. Thank you. Um, we're also here today on March 31st, which is the Trans Day of Visibility. Right. When and the question that I have as we continue to frame this conversation is when are trans folks visible? Right. And as we talk about reproductive justice versus reproductive rights for us to really think about, you know, when trans folks, specifically trans women of color, are part of the conversation around reproductive justice, it's when they have been murdered within the context of the United States. 
and that is an epidemic. It's a it's an it's an epidemic within our communities, right? As we talk about intersectional reproductive justice, and that is a reproductive justice issue. We also sit here today as you know we want to talk about um, reproductive rights around intersectionality, gender equity. We're thinking about, we were just talking about the prison industrial complex, the ways that rape culture impacts our communities. Um, we're talking about our current political climate, right? And whether or not people have agency over their bodies, right? And whether or not, you know, legislature says that someone can choose to carry a pregnancy to full term or not, right? To take care of their bodies, to access the health care they need. And if and when a person is pregnant, a person with potentially a uterus is pregnant, there and there may be a fetus inside of them, there's just been legislature that's been passed so that doctors and medical providers don't need to let people know that the fetus has some kind of developmental issue that could impact the person carrying the little human, right? And that is also a reproductive justice issue, right? So the purpose of today's conversation is not only to talk about who has reproductive rights and who's had access to reproductive rights, but also reframing the conversation within a more intersectional lens so that we can be sure that we understand as a larger University of Minnesota community that reproductive justice, we were joking before, but it's actually in all seriousness, everything is a reproductive justice issue, right? And so that's going to, you know, let it sit on us, let us think about that, let us feel that in our bodies, in our minds, but then also know that today lots of feelings may come up and that's okay if we don't all agree. And this is going to be a really productive hour and a half to talk about the things that um, we could do to transform systems as, a, as community members, but then also the things that we can do together to be in community and support people with whatever spectrum of choice that they want for their bodies, and that is a reproductive justice issue. Um, and I'll leave us with, with the thought of, as we continue to move forward, and for everyone that's going to be engaging in conversation, the question that I'll, I'll put forth to everyone in the room is, how will we, as a University of Minnesota community, continue to complicate and interrogate these reproductive justice issues and make strides toward equity and inclusion in all of our critical conversations. So let that sink in. And I'm, I would also just want you all, if you're able to, give a round of applause for our panelists and I'll introduce them in just a second. But thank you so much for being here already. And I'll go ahead and go down the line and introduce our wonderful panelists. I do want to name that Patina Park and Melissa Kwan could not be here. Um, they had some family things going on for them, so send them some good love and some good vibes. Um, but we are so thankful to have our community here. So directly to my left, um, Ellen Young Samuelson is a um, Samuelson. I'm sorry, is a consultant and has a wide array of experiences, not only directly with reproductive justice in terms of supporting um, through Planned Parenthood um, and being the director of uh, government relations, but has worked with Planned Parenthood Minnesota and as well as North Dakota and South Dakota for a large ten amount of your, um, your experience and tenure. Um, is also a co-founder and board member of the Parents United for Public Schools, or has been. Um, has also served as a legislative assistant and um, associate committee staff for the U.S. Representative Martin Olav Sabo in the U.S. Capitol, as, um, and has a variety of really amazing educational experiences with the William Mitchell College of Law, University of Madison, Wisconsin-Madison, um, and has focused on many interdisciplinary functional areas. So thank you for being here today. Yes. And then Karen Law, who's the executive director of the Pro-Choice Resources, is also here. Karen Law joined PCR in July 2008 as the executive director. Under her leadership, PCR shifted from a reproductive health model to an emerging reproductive justice organization. Karen has worked in the nonprofit sector in the Twin Cities uh, community of Minnesota for over 25 years. Prior to her position at PCR, Karen served as the director of self-sufficiency and Project for Pride in Living, an organization dedicated to empowering families living in poverty through affordable housing, employment training, education, and support services. Karen has spent a majority of her career working on social justice and anti-poverty issues. She has served on numerous neighborhood and community boards and helped to create the first community-based credit union in Minneapolis. Karen attended University of Denver. Hey. 
two great people already. And then, <laughs> and then also, last but not least, I know, we're like, do you have spare time too? <laughs> um, and then finally, we have Jackie, Jackie Trelawney. Jackie believes um, in sex positive education will save the world. Passion driven by her experiences as an educator through the Family Tree Clinic in schools, colleges, with a bulk of time in correctional facilities. Um, her formal education focusing on racial justice, Jackie became passionate about intersectional sexual health and sees it as a way to not only make individuals healthier and confident, but whole communities as well. As the director of community engagement, Jackie naturally sees the power of people and looks to be a bridge between family, family tree clinic and who they serve. She has presented at multiple professional conferences, including the Upper Wet Midwest QIPOC or QIPOC conference, Down Syndrome Association of Minnesota Region Regional Conference, Minnesota Reproductive and Sexual Health Update, and co-presented at the at the annual American Association of Sex Educators and Therapists gathering in 2015. Jackie recently com completed a six-month National Reproductive Justice Fellowship through Core Line that has further impacted her vision of the community, committing to the revolution of revolution being relationship. So, thank you for being here, y'all. Yes. Woo! All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. We're here today to talk a little bit about moving from reproductive rights to moving to reproductive justice. So from where you're at, um, either just in your professional experience and or um, personal experience, right, because we can't necessarily always separate all of it, what does it mean when we say moving from reproductive rights to reproductive justice? And I think we have maybe one hot mic, so maybe we'll just pass it between all of us. One thing is we're also going to be having more of a dialogue between all of us, so um, just know that we might not be looking at you all right away. We might be looking at each other and engaging with each other. For me, so I've worked for the past eight years for Planned Parenthood here in Minnesota, and I've been the Director of Government Relations and, and work up at the Capitol there. Prior to that, as um, Heather said, I had worked for Congressman Martin Sabo, who had been in office before he retired, and then Keith Ellison replaced him. And so I, I do have a political lens on, on how I look at things and how I see change. But um, for moving from reproductive rights to reproductive justice, I think it's an acknowledgement and an all-encompassing movement to embrace the, the truth that for women to have true liberty, they must be able to control their fertility, that they can have a baby, that they don't have to have a baby, and should they have children, that they should be able to have the right to raise their child in a safe and secure environment. And I think that's a very, it's an important shift or, or, or movement that um, certainly Planned Parenthood is embracing, but I think it's an older movement too. I mean, it's been since the early 1990s, I think, but the language is shifting that women need access to affordable, affordable birth control and abortion, and, and, but also homes, ability to feed their children and educate their children. So it's, it's a much broader framework of looking at women's lives and women's ability to pursue, I, I actually do think the Declaration of Independence and that we are all endowed by our creator, whoever our creator is, with the right to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And for women to be able to partake in that, they need to be able to control their fertility. And that is what I think the reproductive justice movement is about. I think, um, you know, in the work that I've been able to do, and I've um, had the good fortune of um, being able to choose this work, that probably when I started um, in nonprofit work over 27 years ago, I, I didn't know that it was called reproductive justice. But I, the frames that I had worked with, the organizations um, that I had uh, the experience with, we were probably using that framework, but we hadn't defined it. And the reason why I say that, when I think about the work that I did, and it's only because, you know, I, I don't think about my experience, but when you have to write a bio, I'm like, oh, yeah, I did this and I did that. Um, and it, it, it's not sort of like to applaud that work, but it's sort of, when I think about economic justice, you know, we in the Phillips neighborhood, 
we had just the thing called unbanks, you know, check cashing stores. And we saw that the families that we were working with didn't have the ability to cash their checks without paying high fees. Um, they weren't able to get loans when they needed it if they were looking at potentially buying a home. And so we, we found the need to be able to have a safe banking system. And historically, the banks in, our, in that community were not there. So our traditional banking systems were not in that community because they didn't see a value in providing financial services to low-income families. So when I think about reproductive justice and our organization, Pro-Choice Resources, which has been in the community for 50 years, and the services that we provide is reproductive and sexual health services to women, youth, their families, and to transgender people who can become pregnant. In this evolution, we understood that, um, and learning from sort of the founding mothers of the reproductive justice movement, um, we found that it's about economic justice, it's about environmental justice, it's about racial justice, it's about um, talking about the series and the complexity of reproductive oppression um, and sexual identity, gender expression, and all of those, those areas because when I walked into the room today, I didn't walk in as Karen Kelly Law, uh, a multiracial person who identifies in, in a certain way and then just come in as that person. I, I came in as my whole self. And I think that the challenge when we have um, just put these silos of reproductive health or reproductive rights it doesn't recognize all of the ways that we live our whole lives and sort of the issues and complexities of when we decide whether or not we are going to have children or how we're going to raise those children and the environment in which we're trying to do that. And, you know, we could spend probably 20 weeks talking about, um, and, you know, I just use that, you know, we're at the university, right? So we're talking about a, you know, we could take a, a semester talking about reproductive oppression, but I think when we, start talking about reproductive justice, we have to start shifting our language um, because it isn't just about abortion access. It isn't about contraceptive access. Um, there is a whole litany of issues. And so I think as we move forward, and we can talk about this more, it's a shift in our language, a shift in reducing stigma and shame and oppression so that we can take back the narrative. I mean, I think, you know, I don't I don't refer to my folks who sit across the table. You know, I, I'm not a lobbyist, but I tend to be at the Capitol testifying on some of the bills, the re, what I call the reproductive oppressive bills that uh, that they introduce every year. You know, but trying to sort of use the words, um, and you know, I haven't made these up. These have been in our language um, for quite some time. But bod bodily autonomy, reproductive justice is about self determination, dignity, um, and um, taking back the narrative and centering our real lives um, as we move forward. And I think that's probably what um, is missing when we just sort of look at a lens where it's just about reproductive rights and reproductive health. And really what I would love, you know, we were just at, uh, many of us were just at Pro-Choice Lobby Day this last Wednesday, and um, I'm lucky. I live in um, I live in Minneapolis, I live in Linden Hills, and I've got just these incredible representatives, but Representative Frank Hornstein, I was in his office, and he was sharing a story about people don't join strategies, people join movements, and they're moved by movements. They are um, engaged when there's something about realizing um, their experiences. And he said, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King, when he made his famous speech, he didn't say, I have a strategy. He said, I have a dream, and when I think about reproductive justice, you know, the dream that I think many of the folks that we work with and our colleagues and allies is about, the dream is reproductive freedom. And I would love to change Pro-Choice Lobby Day to Reproductive Freedom Day because, and, and this isn't my, my idea, so, you know, don't <laughs> attribute it to me. I would love to say, you know, but I, I just think it, it's about all the complexity of our reproductive health, but it, again, that's just a very narrow focus, and that's why I think we have, um, why it's become so politically polarized and stigmatized, because we've been able to put it in camps and sort of sides, and, and that's not how we live. We don't live in camps. We don't live in si on sides, and so my hope is that in this journey, and it's going to evolve, and we're not all going to get there at the same time and we're going to get on and off that bus at different moments depending on what's going on in our lives but that would be my vision and my hope for this this is so great 
Uh, yeah, um, my name is Jackie again. And when I think of um, reproductive rights to reproductive justice, the first thing that came to my mind is like from moving from the like legislation to the streets, like what actually we're experiencing in the world versus like up in the air, people signing papers, you know, for us to be able to do things. It's like how, how, um, how our lives are really experiencing health and access. And, it, um, and really intersectionality is like the word that really um, is weighted for me when I think of reproductive justice. And intersectionality is a word that I think can be easy to say, but it has very powerful implications. Um, <clears throat> and um, it's kind of to what you were saying, just like, we that's a part of who I am right like my I have a lot of parts to my identity and I can't take parts of it out when I'm in a space so um like I was at this event recently oh I'm just gonna name what it was oh yeah I'm gonna do that it was the fourth annual community forum on race in Brooklyn Park I'm from Brooklyn Park kind of and so Brooklyn Park has talked about race four times which is awesome and um, one, of the, one of the things that was hard for me in that discussion was we were instructed to isolate race. And I'm like, look at your face. See, your face is like, what? <laughs> like, right, because that's actually impossible for me to do, right? Like, I, I live my life and have experienced my life based on the intersections of who I am, depending on who I'm dealing with and their intersections of how they see me, right? So, like, I can't just isolate parts of my identity. And so... Um, for reproductive justice to be the shift, it allows me and my community to be seen in an intersectional way. Um, and we named, we some people, I mean, I think we've kind of named about like abortion is a place where a lot of the conversation was, right? And I, I'm, I'm gonna talk about this because uh, I'm assuming that we all don't know the same things, right? So. Abortion, the, the challenge with having abortion being like the main narrative for, for like pro-choice conversations, right? Like, well, first of all, the word choice is, is a challenging word for, for people with uh, intersecting identities that have socialized uh, oppression, right? But for, for, let's talk about black uteruses. Um, when, when slavery, uh, was a reality here um we're talking about like old slavery uh black uteruses were really under control right so like forced breeding and control around breeding african slaves and indigenous people as well and uh so that doesn't allow for choice right and that also there's a lot of controlling of of the reproductive function of, of people. And if you control the reproduction of any species, you control. You control that species, right? Like if you control the reproductive function of any species, then you control that particular species. So like the power in, in that is, is something that needs to be named that like, for the history, the, um, the history of black uterus, and I'm saying black uteruses, and I do mean women too, right? But like I'm, I, like I'm talking about reproduction, so this is just the, the language that I use. Um, but it's also it's not just about the fight for black women to not have kids, right? About abortion, it's like we got to fight to have our kids, like to be able to even get pregnant. Um, right or like to have a child and to be supported by community so reproductive choice um around like pro-choice it's like yeah i'm totally pro-choice i'm pro-choice to have an abortion i'm also pro-choice to be able to have a family and especially for people that are black and people of color that is um, something that's always under attack <laughs> always under attack is um, is black uteruses and people of color reproducing uh, okay and I think that's all I wanted to I can ramble so let's just keep on going
it's okay. I just wanted to talk about the word choice because Jackie touched upon it. You know, at Pro-Choice Resources, you know, as I said, we're an emerging reproductive justice organization. You know, to be, a, I, I think, a true reproductive justice organization, you know, again, acknowledging the former mothers of this movement, um, as Ellen talked about in the 90s, and then sort of a revisiting that um, in early 2000. It was Asian Communities for Reproductive Justice in California, who is now Forward Together, and um, Sister Song out of Atlanta. And these two organizations, they were part of, um, there was a, a a worldwide conference, and it was um, on human, basic human rights. And they were talking about reproductive choice and specifically about abortion access. And the thing about choice is that, um, you know, yes, you can say in the simplest form, you're making the decision, the choice to have a child or not have a child. But for communities that had been historically oppressed, and particularly communities of color, um, they didn't always have that choice. They didn't have that decision-making power. So we've moved from saying, although our name is Pro-Choice Resources, um, and that's that's problematic for us in, in many ways, um, but the identity of that movement did not recognize um, people of color voices, and for various reasons. And so we talk about decision-making because you don't always have a choice. If you're a victim of sexual assault, domestic violence, um, sexual coercion, you didn't make that choice to become pregnant, but you have to make the decision of whether or not you're going to parent. And so we've talked about decision making because there's also power in the word decision making. And, and that's what we're talking about, this shift in this culture, in, in taking back the narrative of shifting the language and understanding why folks need to have the power in that language and sort of, and, and decide the words that they want to use to define themselves and define the decision making that they do. And so there is a lot of power in, in words. And so I think it's, you know, I, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, what are they upset about with that? You know, that's not such a bad word, you know, whatever that might be, right? We all have our isms. But again, I shouldn't be making that decision and I should recognize, okay, this is why they have difficulty with saying that or with being identified that way. You know, one of the things I think in about, um, in about reproductive health rights versus reproductive justice, one of the examples that I think is a, a good example is um, when we're talking about access to reproductive health care, folks say, well, we can just have that clinic, you know, up north. I'm like, well, that might be challenging for the communities who live up north who where their grandparents went to that clinic and it was forced sterilization or forced birth control because they didn't want any more members of that community to live in that, you know, uh, any more members, additional family members in that community. So, you know, this is, it, it, there's so many layers of this, and that's why we're not trying to throw it all out. We're just trying to have open conversations so folks can talk about their lived experiences. And, and I think, you know, I'm learning every day about this because it is about sort of the intersectionality about all of the movements, about how we live our lives and, and the history of our lives and the complexity of it. So I think, you know, we can make this, it's difficult, it's challenging, the stories oftentimes are heartbreaking, but then there are opportunities um, to uh, lighten this, to lift this up, and, and that's why I'm really thankful that the university invited me, um, invited my colleagues, you know, for us to be able to have this discussion and for you to be here, and I really do hope to, that you'll ask us questions so we can talk about this, because I know I don't learn from a panel necessarily, I, you know, from someone talking at me, I learn most when I'm in discussion um, with other people, so I'm really grateful that you took the time to be here with us today. Yes, and I think that you all really um, vibrantly highlight the, the different facets of reproductive justice, right? So it's not also just about the fact that there may have been um, the, you know, the one clinic that's up north that was also a space for sterilization, but then if that's going to be the space that we're going to continue to use, how do we make sure that people can even access to get there, right? And who's seeing them? Do the clinicians look like them? Are they competent, right? It's not just, oh, you know, this is what's, this is kind of maybe what's going on with your body and certain bodies being paid attention to more than others. 
Right. Um, and so when we talk about that, I think it's 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 a it's a complicated conversation. Right. And not just, you know, what's the choice, what's the decision, but are people aware of all of the parts that go into that decision? Right. When we talk about people who get pregnant, you know, I used to work with, uh, on a college campus. I was a confidential resource and did a lot of this this um, support. Right. And the students would come in and they're like, I think I'm pregnant. And I was like, well, how how how? Tell me more. Right. And students would be like, well, you know, we engaged in this one in this one kind of, you know, sexual activity. Uh, we had oral sex. Someone ejaculated and um, I'm probably pregnant now. Right. And so we actually had to stop and say, where where's the issue? Because in order for a person who is, you know, who is ovulating, who has a uterus to get pregnant, there has to be some kind of, you know, sperm involved and ejaculation. Right. And let's talk about where and how. And, you know, we had to start with that whole conversation of actually what is pregnancy? What is consent? Right. So it's 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 not just about the end game, the end, quote unquote, of someone getting pregnant. But do people understand how that all happens and what's what are their bodies do people feel like they can name their bodies and have a have a relationship with their bodies right whether it's you know masturbation or playing with sex toys or having multiple relationships right feeling like they can access um, these these different places right I think that those are all parts of it and so as we continue to move from I think you know it's important to name the people who started the conversations because I know I'm, I'm from California I was working with with some of the organizations so that's why I'm like heck yeah name them because we need to and I think a lot of the context around reproductive rights is really from a white feminist lens that people weren't able to access right it's that legacy of anti-blackness and slavery and that's important to name um, so we're talking about inclusion, right? I think the idea that I'm taking away from this is that reproductive justice is supposed to be intersectional and inclusive. And so from where you all sit in the multiple places and roles that you play in your organizations and I'd say also in your communities or our communities, what would it mean if we were to get imaginary and dream Right. Imagination and creativity is really important in case you didn't hear that from all of us. Right. Um, if we were to dream. How we, how do we become um, intersectional and, and more inclusive in all of our work around reproductive justice? And then we'll talk more of the what's really going on in the you know, U.S. context. But how do we imagine? Tell me more. Get get creative and weird with me. Uh, good question. Again, my background is political and it's at the state legislature and the Minnesota legislature right now, um, the Senate is Republican and the House is Republican and the, the Republican right, the, the party right now has put women's reproductive justice and their opposition to it in the, it is fundamental to their party stance right now. And so I guess if I were to dream, <laughs> that would not be the case. And we would be working together to ensure that all women can have a baby, don't have to have a baby, and can raise their children again in a safe community. Right now, my job, right now, today, there are bills in the state legislature. We have a state family planning program that was passed in 1978, but in a bipartisan fashion. It today, the Senate, uh, I think on Monday, but the, it's in the bill, the Senate bill, which is a Republican bill, would cut it by $2 million flat. Then they also have a 7% across the board cut. There are bans, and Karen uh, just testified a couple weeks ago, there's two abortion bills at the, in the Senate and in the House. One would get rid of uh, state funding for abortion for poor women. Another would uh, require abortion clinics to meet some certain physical standards, building standards, where we, there's five clinics in the state of Minnesota. We'd go down to one. And it's actually just the only Planned Parenthood building that does. Planned Parenthood has 17 clinics in the state of Minnesota. Only one performs abortions. So in the, there's other bills that I'd, I could tell you more. One, But here, I do want to tell you that here's another Republican bill <laughs> that would... Um, in, mandate all insurance companies, they, they go to their employer and they have a policy that an employer can buy or can provide to their employees. They want to make sure that these plans, that employers can decide not to offer uh, plans that provide 
birth control, IUDs, it's IUDs, emergency contraception, and any other contraception that is deemed an abortive fashion. The birth control, and the party will go on to say the birth control pill also is, and I always think I mispronounce that word, by the way, I think I call it fascist, but, um, but uh, so I guess my dream would be that we would be working in a bipartisan fashion, but the party has been taken over and has adopted a very fundamental right-wing view on this. And one last thing I do want to say, it's, I started at Planned Parenthood eight years ago, and my predecessor said to me, I remember we were having lunch, she goes, you are so lucky. She had been working for Planned Parenthood since early, late, early 80s, late 70s. You are so lucky because you're coming when birth control is not controversial. Most of my career, birth control is controversial, and it's not anymore. Well, eight years ago, it wasn't. But birth control is controversial again. And it's not because of the reproductive justice movement. It's because of the opposition. And sometimes I think I, uh, my, my more optimistic way of looking at it is as we make progress and gay marriage is legal or, and, and people are talking about the transgender issues, you know, as there is slow social justice progress, the pushback is so much stronger and harsh. And just yesterday, or was it Wednesday, the vice president went to the Senate and cast the, the, at the U.S. Senate, cast the deciding vote that now states could defund Planned Parenthood. I mean, that, that's the one, one of the few things they've achieved over the last 10 weeks. It's, so, back to my dream. My dream is that that would not be the case. <laughs> yeah, again, just kind of, piggybacking on what Ellen, you know, my dream is uh, the U.S. would look like Denmark when we talk about reproductive freedom, right? And, and, right, and, and, but part of it is in their policies because they don't have policies, the restrictive policies um, and the, and then, and the discriminatory nature in which the policies are brought forth. Um, in Denmark, sex ed is the norm. Children from at children starting at school age receive scientifically based, medically accurate, comprehensive sex ed that is appropriate for their age. They have lower pregnancy um, rates, you know, unintended pregnancy rates, lower rates of um, folks who have to access abortion, and people are informed. We know when people are informed, when people are educated, they make the decisions that are best for themselves and their family. In Minnesota, we have been fighting for years, but way before we started this work, for a comp sex ed bill. So I don't know, I mean, if you went to school here, you know, depending on what school, what district, what part of town, who your school board was, who your principal was, who the parents were, you didn't get comp sex ed in school. Maybe the science teacher sort of brought up something like this and said, well, maybe... Um, we put a rubber on a condom, <laughs> and then you don't get pregnant. Okay, boys and girls, any questions? No, okay. So now we're going to move to amoebas, and that was your sex ed in class, or you were separated by gender, what, it, what they thought should be your gender, and you were separated by gender. Um, and we know that kids don't learn in that kind of environment. We know, and we did this with research um, with the University of Minnesota Center for Prevention and Research, and I, I get that wrong, but... Um, uh, working in partnership with them a few years ago, we did a, a study on uh, parents and youth about sex ed. And youth want to hear from their parents about sex ed. They don't want to learn on a bus from their friends, from MTV. You can tell how old I am, right? MTV, whatever it is right now, the Kardashians, whomever. My, <laughs> well, MySpace isn't even around now, right? I mean, Snapchat, whatever it is, right? They don't want to learn from that. They want to learn from their parents. And the and what was the research? The research said parents are most uncomfortable talking to their kids about their sexual health. So, you know, there's this, this gap, and we need to change that. So in Denmark, you know, and it took them 10 years to do it, but now um, they do that. And uh, I think sex ed in the schools, so my, in my utopia, my vision, right, Den Denmark probably has their problems as well, but from a reproductive freedom standpoint, I think that that would be the ideal where... Um, for example, if you live in Flint, Michigan, you, the water is safe for your children to have. If you become pregnant, you are not worried about birth defects. If um, we, with the 
you know, Dakota Access Pipeline, you know, all of those issues, right? Water is an environmental justice issue. So people would start to recognize the links between all of these issues that you need to be able to raise the children you have or to live yourself in a safe and healthy environment. And so, you know, that would be my dream that folks who are fighting the fight for 15, the fight to raise the minimum wage, that people understand that when you are deciding to have children or not, if you don't make a living wage, if your employer gets to determine your type of health insurance, all of that impacts your ability to thrive in your community. And, um, you know, so, you know, I, you know, now this lens, this RJ lens, and when we used to do trainings in the classroom, we would get those big plastic colorful glasses so that have just a little shade of orange or red so people could put it on because once you start looking in through that lens, you can't see it any other way. You don't, the, the silos are gone. So the right to a living wage, health insurance, your employer doesn't get to dictate those things. The food, the water that's grown that you're eating, or you know that it all makes sense. It is mind-boggling to me, um, being at the Capitol, sort of what is said across across the table from these reproductive oppressors, because they have said, no, we actually don't want you to have children, mm -hmm. and we also, if you do have, but we also don't want you to have an abortion. But right. then, if you do have children, we're not going to raise. We're not going to raise the minimum grant if you were on government assistance. So since 1986, the amount that a, a single person who's raising a child, one child, is $437. It has not changed since 1986. So two weeks ago, they were trying to raise that grant by $100 a month. It was turned down. It was voted down. They, they said, we'll do $10 a month, but we won't do $100 a month. And I just want to say, then right following that, that's when Karen had to testify on the Medicaid funding ban for abortion. So they, were, they didn't want women to access health care, but at the same time, they were not going to pass an increase on the basic welfare grant. It, it is incredible. So, I, so the dream is sort of, we have a society and we live in a community where we may not all be in the same place, but we share the same basic values that we all should be allowed for certain basic human rights. And it's not certain basic human rights, it's the tenets of basic human rights. And I would you know, love to see if someone is voted to office, they have to be able to de declare, um, to be able to state the Declaration of Universal Human Rights because that is what is missing right now, I think, in our in our society, and when I look at sort of the political discourse that it's going across, not just in our state, but across the country, I'm like, did you forget that's a basic human right to be able to live, to be able to choose to parent, to be able to eat, thrive, drink the water, and know that it's, you know, the water that I'm drinking is not, po you know, poisonous. So it is, you know, I, I have a hard time understanding how f people don't see that and the hypocrisy in it. So, you know, I know that, um, you know, Ellen works at the clinic and they have to have their patients sign something afterwards saying that they won't come and protest at the clinic after they've received their procedure because people will say it was okay for me, but it's not okay for you. Mm -hmm. And so the hypocrisy. So I, I think, you know, living in a society where we, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to access this because I need it, but I'm going to control you and I'm going to control your body because I don't want any more of you. And so my dream is, we'll all go to Denmark, learn the best practices, and bring them back to Minnesota. Minnesota is a great place to live, but we have we have some work to do. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about truth today. Uh, and I think that my dreams are really tied to the dreams that we have up here too. Um, and my dream is that people see their own benefit in reproductive justice. Like, I really spiritually believe that when we all do better, we all do better. Yeah. Um, and that my liberation is tied with other people's liberation. Um, if, if my sister is not free, then I am not either. Um, 
and we all do benefit we do benefit when we all do better you know like then i'm able to support other people right we're able to support each other um so i think that where because we we're talking about intersectionality and like how how we do this and how to dream it um and I think about like uh, my own internal bias and how I have learned and been socialized and honestly steeped in white supremacy, you know, in this country and learning about um, how that affects how I see the world. And I've spent a lot of time learning about this and deconstructing it in my own self. I want to invite other people to that journey. I mean, quite honestly, like really seeing yourself as an individual, what you have to do to change the systems that live within you. That's like not a taboo thing to say, right? Like it's like we've all been, we all drank the same tea, okay? <laughs> as far as like being, well, maybe not everybody, let me not speak for everybody, but like I know that I have been raised in a culture of white supremacy and that really affects the way that I see gender, race, and ability and a lot of other things. So, um, and it's intersectional. So my journey of, of learning about that, like learning about gender, learning about the flexibility of gender, learning about the history of race and where that came from and that it's all made up, right? Like, I mean, racism is real and that has big, big impacts, but like learning about the, the history of these things um, is that it was very, very important. Uh, somebody named storytelling at one point on the panel, I think it was you, Karen. And, um, and so like knowing about our history and how, um, what has happened in the past, um, especially with the systems that are in, in place around ability and gender and race, um, I think it's important to know that and see how you personally play with that in your life and in your professional work. Um, that has really affected my intersectional view of the world. I mean, like I work with a lot of deaf people at, at my job, a family tree, um, and I have a lot of friends that are deaf. and. Before working at Family Tree, I had, did not have that perspective. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, that's like a huge intersection of like uh, people that are just totally invisible. And, and deaf people are queer, black, and like all the other intersections of life, right? Like, we're, but they're just not visible. So, and, and like, I think when I think about reproductive justice, I think about a friend of mine who is black, queer uh, trans and wants to parent like and deaf and deaf right so like nobody wants to talk to them <laughs> and nobody wants to take the time and this person is about to be an amazing parent someday like such an amazing parent and is being denied a lot of access to that it's like what like there's some cool people out here that want to do good things and i know some people that might not want to be parents all right um, so what can we do to support all of these people? Uh, yeah, so I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, I think somebody else that talked about, like, I'm constantly learning and that's a big commitment that I have made to, to be like committing myself to shifting the way that I see the world. Um, I think that the world does change um, and I don't want to, I don't want to be left behind or leaving people behind. So that's a big commitment for myself to lifelong learning and uh, breaking down the systems that I have been steeped in. Thank you. Some, yeah, you said we're speaking truth today. Um, yeah, and I think that I think that all of you, what you all are talking about is really important as we talk about reproductive justice, right? So, you know, I was telling someone the other day, deportation and detention, they're reproductive justice issues, right? We're breaking up families and do people have access to the care that they need? People are dying, right? Or when we talk about folks accessing, um, you know, hormones or care or, or the, the ways that they need to embody their own bodies, right, and they're denied that, that's a reproductive justice issue too, right? And not to bog people down and say, oh my gosh, everything's a reproductive justice issue, but now that the glasses are on, right, everything as we're navigating becomes that. And it is intersectional, right? So that's a Kimberly, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw is the one that coined intersectionality, right? Black feminist, 
thought, right? And so that has definitely been used and co-opted in a lot of ways. And what are the ways that we can actually practice it, right? I think that that's really important, especially as intersectionality is hot, right? Right now, I feel like a lot of people are talking about intersectionality, but how do we actually practice it is a, is a larger conversation around our own internalized white supremacy and privilege, right? But then how do we learn and unlearn and continue to do that work? Um, I think we've talked, I mean, everything that we've talked about is the challenges given the current political climate. So what I, <laughs> Right, everyone's been like, let me tell you what's really going on in life. Um, but maybe what we can do actually right now is, um, well, let's open it up maybe, because I know that um, Ellen has to catch a flight. Um, but let's open it up for some questions and then um, we'll end with what are some tools and tactics? What are the takeaways? What's the so what, now what? All right, so does this microphone work? Check it. Check, check. We're out of luck. Okay. All right. We got, well, yeah. So maybe what can happen is if folks want to ask a question, I'm going to restate it and repeat it into the microphone. How does that feel for folks? I think. Oh, it's working. Is this working? People can hey, hear? Wendy, what's up? Hey, microphone magic. I know for the viewers at home. No, I'm just kidding. For the viewers at home, we've got two mics. All right. So questions, thoughts, feelings. What's up, folks? Yay, Jessica. So I guess my initial question is, I am very new to organizing and activism. I come from a space of privilege with being white, upper middle class, mostly able-bodied, cis-passing but capable of getting pregnant. So I know that I am not directly impacted by many of the things that are currently passing through our government and our political climate. Um, but I find myself still frustrated with being an activist in this time, especially being so young, because I have seen a lot of false, like false information being passed and having that accepted as truth. And it's hard to be an activist in this climate sometimes. And I was wondering if we could talk a bit about how to navigate those feelings and how to progress forward as a community with that. So in the age of alternative facts, no, but really, um, how, how do you navigate doing the advocacy and the activism, not burning out, right, and being able to lift as we climb, per se? So any thoughts? Um, well, to answer the very last, how not to get burned out, we have to do things that fuel us and give us energy. So if you love going to a rally, go to a rally. But things that you love, we might go do things that fuel you. But I have I've thought about this, too. And then I also want to quote, quote Keith Ellison. But um, I think we all have to do things that put us out of our comfort zone in today's world. So depending whatever your comfort zone is, just push a little farther. I did hold it. It was easy for me. I held, I held a postcard party and I had people come write postcards to legislators um, about mainly people were writing about, please don't repeal Obamacare. I had a couple women come who had never done anything ever. And they were nervous and they thought they had to know all the facts about the ACA. And I said, you don't need to eat. You don't want it to be repealed, just write you don't want it to be repealed. But I could tell it was it was really hard for them. They were very much out of their comfort zone. So what it made me do is think about my own self. Because I I'm comfortable doing a lot, but there are things I am not comfortable about. And Frank, to be honest with you, I'm not very political at all on my Facebook page. But I thought I've got to go outside of my comfort zone and start pushing and talking to people that I run into, you know, this guy doesn't want to vote for Hillary because of um, Benghazi. You know, what the hell? What about Benghazi? You know, just to take on some of those uncomfortable conversations, things that you wouldn't have done because it's not in your comfort zone. Just put yourself a little farther, join a group or go write a postcard. But I have been thinking about people who are doing more than they've ever done and they are out of their comfort zone, so I have to get out of mine. And then I'm just going to quote Keith Ellison. I, all of you go home and, and, and Google it. Look at the YouTube video where he says, buck up. Buck up, everybody. Yeah, it's hard. But it ain't nothing the way it was in the 60s and the 70s when dogs were being sicked on people. And it's 
it's he's he was um, running at the time for the DNC chair, and he was down talking to a group at um, I think it was down south actually. But I thought that's right. I got to buck up. Yep, there's a lot of false news out there. Oh well, you know we we all just got to keep on moving on and get louder and stronger and get to whatever degree you can out of your comfort zone. The reason why I said yay, Jessica. Jessica was a former intern at uh, at Pro Choice Resources last summer. She helped us with our, our state fair. So we're the only, you know, again, sort of the language, but by definition, the only pro choice organization at the state fair. And we've been there for 43 years. So the state fair, we call it the state fair, but it, it's a semi-quasi government institution, and they want us out of there every year because they said we're not family friendly because we distribute 10,000 condoms on a stick. And, um, and they say they're a choking hazard. I'm like, everything at the state fair, if you've been there, is a choking hazard. You have to keep your child very close or your partner very close because, you know, there's other safety hazards. It isn't our condoms on a stick. But... Um, just acknowledging Jessica's work with us and moving forward our reproductive justice framework at the state fair because folks are coming from across the state and across from the country and like this is the first time I can talk about this out loud or we have the folks that come the most are uh, again never judge a book by its cover I see someone coming up and I'm like oh they're gonna do this as they pass our booth 99% of the folks do this but it was a grandma whose granddaughter was going to school, going to college, and she's like, oh, I just want to put these condoms in a stick in her care package. So, you know, again, it's the moving out of our comfort zone. And, you know, you know, back to your question, I think one of the challenges right now that I see, and we have two college-age um, kids in college right now um, in my house, and the advent of social media and the impact that it's had on on us to be able to have conversations. You know, as Ellen said, she's not um, as politically active on Facebook, you know, considering the work that she does. And I'm, I am, I'm not, I dip in, I dip out, certainly because of the work that I do, people know where I'm sitting, um, you know, in this movement. But I think what it has um, taken away from us is the opportunity to have in-person discussions, right? How many people have you unfriended in the last couple of years? You're like, I'm done with you, you know, when they posted, I'm for the oppressors, whatever it is that they're oppressing about us. So I think, you know, that that's a challenge. We have to, again, challenge, um, push ourselves not to do that unfriend, because then we miss the opportunity to have that conversation. And I think the easiest question, because there's no judgment in it, it's just tell me why you feel that way. Tell me why you voted for that person. And, and, when they can do that, when you can just take that moment to understand, and you still may say, I still think that's just absolutely terrible or whacked or just that's just not okay, but at least you can have that moment where you can talk about it. And um, so this is really bizarre, but someone one day called me the abortion whisperer. And so it's, it's an odd, you know, it's an odd title. And, you know, but I'll just give you the reason why they said this. You know, my daughter, who's in college now, and she plays volleyball, and so volleyball and sports was, it was just a big part of our lives. And, uh, you know, running in the communities, you know, when you play a sport or if you're, you have a child who is musically inclined or in the theater, your lives get taken over and you're gone every night and every weekend following them across, if, you know, if they have that opportunity across the country. And so folks would say, well, Karen, I, I know you work. What do you do? And I'm like, hmm, okay. And I would start off with, you know, I work for Pro-Choice Resources. And our name obviously just sort of talk, you know, it, um, defines or at least gives an idea of what, what I do. And I would have folks say, well, you have kids. And I'm like, yes. And then I would use that opportunity to say I was able to make, my husband and I were able to make the decision of when we wanted to parent, how, where, all of those things and and so that's why I do this work and I do this work because I have children and so I think you know going back to the how um, and also I would say actually everything about you is under attack right now at the legislature in Minnesota I mean you know when you look at not just bills about reproductive health and reproductive justice but 
um, you know, the internet privacy. I mean, all of those things that are that are happening right now today. Transit, you're, you know, I came here on the light rail today. You know, they're wanting to cut that, and they're wanting to cut it because they don't use it. And so, and and this is the reason why. So, um, they said because we're not selling enough cars. And so, you know, it's just those sort of absurdities. You know, so we're going to pollute the environment. We've talked about, you know, mass transit. So anyway, I'm going off the subject, but, um, it's you know, all it's all reproductive justice, right? I mean, it really is. I mean, but it's about justice in general, right? It's all of the social justice movement. So, you know, uh, Ellen said self-care. That's really important right now because we feel, because we get everything in an instant, you're on Snapchat, you're on, well, Vine is gone, but Twitter, Insta, all of those things, we are... I'm, I'm going to use this word, we are um, being assaulted mm -hmm. by the media, mm -hmm. right? And we have allowed it, if we have, to come into our lives. So you're sitting there, even when you don't want it on, it's popping on. So I think we've got to turn that off. We've got to start talking to each other. Um, you know, it's rallies, it's writing letters, it's, um, but I think most, you know, it's talking to your family, talking to your friends, talking to your coworkers. Just really quick, I know that Ellen has to step out, so if, if we could just say thank you to you, and thank then... You. I, I want to say thank you. I, I wish I was staying. I actually do have to go because I do have to catch a plane. I did want to do a shout-out for Maria, Maria Rude back there, who was a state rep um, from Eden Prairie, and... Um, really took on some of the legislators with some of the more outrageous things that happened. And um, Karen's testified before Maria's committee. She was on the health care committee and worked on sex sexuality education and all the other really important issues. So thank you. And you know what? I want to say one thing before I leave. Everybody here run for office. I, I, we got to run for office. And women, you've got to run for office. And so Go back home, find out where you live, find out who you're, what district you're, I mean, find out what legislative district you live in, and run for office. And we need you. So please do it. And I have to go, but I really appreciate this very, very much. Thank you. Just a quick round of applause for Ellen. And then I'm going to pass it back over to Jackie. Jackie, do you have any other thoughts just around? I'm going to scoot over so we're a little bit closer. It's more of an intimate conversation. Um, Uh, well, I really um, so strongly agree with what Karen was saying about the media being so evil. <laughs> oh, wait, you didn't say that. I said that. Okay, all right, co-sign, co-sign, so evil. <laughs> and, uh, and that we really need to get together with each other and talk to each other face-to-face. -face. I just think about how... Um, how communication, even face-to-face, -face, we can have miscommunication, right? Like via language, via body language, like all those types of things. And we're just getting further and further and further away from understanding each other. And uh, in my bio, it says that I, that I um, believe that the revolution is a relationship. And that also is something that is very easy to say, but then very very challenging in practice because we live in a culture of exile. Um, if, if you like, and now let me say, let me own myself in this too, because like I have practiced exile and I'm, and I'm still figuring this out. Like I was just talking about uh, an auntie that I got a little beef with. Um, and, and I, I, my practice that I have been taught is to be like, you know what, auntie, I can't even deal with you. I'm going to go ahead and put you on this shelf over here. You're going to get dusty on that shelf and I'm not going to ever go back there, you know, for that pain. I'm not going to think about it a lot, but I'm not going to forget it, you know? So like that relationship is so necessary though for like for us to understand each other and to hear each other the impli the power in that is so deep um and if we expand this like this idea the revolution as a relationship to our communities um we all are invested in each other's issues and like like we were saying, reproductive justice is, is really everything. I mean, we were talking about transportation. I'm like, well, now people can't get to their appointments, you know, if we're cutting transportation or school or all those other things. Um, 
So like talking to each other is really, really important so we can share each other's stories and, and really deeply understand each other um, and not exile each other. So that when you were talking about activism um, and like practices and like how to do things, I think that's something that's really important. Um, like I have two friends right now that haven't talked to each other for going on three years and they are both powerful black queer artists. And um, that's breaking up our community. It's like we're doing white supremacy's job for it. Like, come on now. And I will not give up my love for either of those people. And I feel like leading with love, I'll, I'll, with this is also a big part of my propaganda too. You know, like being able to cross communities, see the things that we love about each other and check ourselves um, when we're not hearing and seeing other people. So, you know, reproductive justice, also in my um, intersects with, um, oh my gosh, the word just left me, restorative justice, I'm sorry. Restorative justice, which is like, instead of uh, prosecuting people and putting them in jail and that being the practice, like working through our challenges and our ruptures in our community to create a repair. Um, so yes, repairing and and repairing the ruptures in our community is really based on relationships, and I think that's something that um, is easy to, like I said before, easy to say, really hard to do in practice, really hard to do in practice. Other questions? Hi, I just want to thank you all for um, taking the time out today. So I have two questions um, related to the RJ um, movement. One is how, in your opinion, any one of you can answer is how do, as a reproductive justice movement, you elevate, you continue to elevate um, women of color in historically disenfranchised and marginalized communities and white spaces, AKA white mainstream organizations or spaces in general. And number two, how do we move from, I like to say the tired rhetoric of the trending hashtag RJ to really being authentic and really challenging um, people who like to say they're reproductive justice allies and advocates um, and supporters to really challenging around white cis female privilege. Because I noticed that you mentioned before that this RJ movement came out of white oppression supremacy and it's still operating. And you know, how, how do we challenge that and not talk about it? And, and I appreciate what you said, Jackie, as how do we check ourselves? But the reality is when you're talking to someone, they can empathize and sympathize with your real lived experience, but if they can't check their own white privilege, it goes nowhere, it goes to a certain place. So those are my two questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the other person. You could drop that mic, it's okay, it's hot. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but really, it is hot. So um, I'm actually going to pop in on this, too. I think that, <laughs> um, you know, I just came from a conference and, and was doing um, a panel or actually a panel presentation dialogue around um, what is actually inclusive. What is inclusive reproductive justice? How do we talk about intersectional work and move it beyond like the lip service of it? Right. Um, and so some of it for me is around the politic. Right. So if we utilize something like a critical trans politic that really or a critical mixed race studies lens. Right. I'm a theory head, but it's also like, how do we make it accessible? Um, how do we center the people with the most marginalized identities? in all of our work, not as a tokenizing piece, but actually build relationship and recognize that if we are indeed engaging in inclusive reproductive justice, those folks, the trans women of color with disabilities who are unemployed, who, um, you know, who, who maybe don't have access to healthcare, who are navigating ability, et cetera, et cetera, are the ones that really are at the core and they lead the movement. Because for me, so as someone who's multiracial and white and Asian, like I still participate in, in white supremacy, right? And I have plenty of times and people who, who I've been raised with, we have woke mic. Um, we have had access to the mic. So what does it mean for people who are engaging, who are cis, straight, white women, right? These are people in my community and all of our communities who are doing a really good work, but also recognize maybe I don't need to be at the center and maybe I need to give my mic to someone else. How do I support and co-sign and not just be what we were talking about earlier an ally i'm going to put quotes around ally but how do we actually be accomplices in this kind of work right and some of it is also about the process who's making the decisions 
right? Legislatively, we know who's making the decisions, right? But in our own communities, how are we replicating that kind of violence where people aren't even at the table? We can't have a, re re you know, a reproductive justice conversation if, you know, folks who are the most marginalized aren't at the table. It's not even a conversation then. Right, so some of it's that. Some of it is also like I find my communities, right, and people maybe just because they're brown or black doesn't mean they're down, right, and just because we're queer, we're not all here, right, but we can also relate in and say, what's going on? Like, how can I support you? How do we build real authentic relationships and not necessarily agree, but we could show up with and for each other in the ways that we can? And how do we elevate the privilege that we do have instead of saying, well, I have this, you have that, we need to fight over the resources, right? And I think that it's gonna take a huge reframe around some of this, right? And some of it is also educating our own people, right? So for me, like our own people of color are taking each other down. That's not okay either, right? That is what, you know, we're doing white supremacies work for us, right? So I think we need to think about that and that's more of the tangible, but then also how are we forgiving ourselves, working with each other and building those authentic relationships? I would not be here today if it weren't for some really good white people who supported me and I called them out, they called me out and we work together in community. If we're going to do community work, we need to actually do the work, right? So I feel you, I'm mad, I'm mad all the time. No, I'm like, no, 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 I'm just saying, I feel you, I'm with you, I'm mad all the time. It's like the first way I describe myself, I'm angry, right? But it's also okay to be angry and like there's trauma, there's historical trauma um, that a lot of people with marginalized identities are, are, are navigating. It's in our bones, it's in our DNA. So that's just real. I guess I got handed the mic. Uh, well, I I might also need a little bit of reiteration on the on the question too, but I, I really. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have been playing with this idea also in my mind on like uh, groups that are like really exclusive, you know, like POC exclusive groups or like women exclusive groups. Um, and I think about like how white supremacy will exist in all of those spaces still, you know, without a cis white dude, you know, in a space, like we still do it to each other. So part of me saying that like no, naming my bias is like naming those things, you know, the things that I have learned. Um, I'm not sure if, if what, what um, you mentioned something that I said and I was just wondering if maybe you had pushed back. Uh, no, you mentioned about like. Hold on one second. I, okay. yeah. I, I usually have a pretty loud. I like dialogue. Oh, well, we're recording, we're recording. You mentioned uh, white supremacy and about checking on that, you know, checking your like white supremacy and it was kind of a nuance the way you were saying it. it wasn't bad but my question more pointly is the fact that how as a reproductive justice movement particularly in this political and social climate where we're taught when you're looking at people adamantly being proud to talk about eugenicism mm -hmm. how do we as a reproductive justice movement not only tell our real lived experience about what rj means but that only goes so far when you're also dealing with white privilege, particularly white cis female privilege within reproductive justice, rights, and choice. So how do we continue to push back and say, yeah, I'm telling my story, but my story only goes so far, and you can only sympathize and empathize when you can't accept your own white privilege and also your part and our part in a um, persistent uh, and perpetuation of oppression. Yeah. I mean, it's like, the, to me, the question is also like the answer, like, you know, because like people acknowledging their internalized like racial superiority is like such an important thing. And to me, like, I don't find this to be a taboo thing. Like, I think that's that there's a lot of fear around naming that. And I'm like, but that's good that we do that because yeah, you got to be able to name the evil to get rid of it. Um, I got to be able to find the mold to to get out of my house. Um, 
Right. So I think that like us having this conversation, right? Like I see, you know, different types of faces. There's intersections of people here and um, our, the seats aren't filled. So there's some people that miss this conversation. So that means that we need to be louder. I think that part of the, the, oh, it was Ellen that mentioned that like, uh, do something that's out of your, out of your comfort zone. Um, and us really talking about this. And, but I do really feel like it's important to center these voices though. I mean like, yes, us being in conversation, but like, why can't we focus on black trans women? You know, like that's like, that's really important. Especially if, if the dialogue is not about that, we spend a lot of time not talking about them. Let's talk about how communities are being affected. So yeah, giving voices and storytelling, I think don't have enough um, value in comparison to like research and studies. Uh, I don't like that legacy. It, like that is also to me like where white supremacy lives and wins is like, let's do all this paperwork and research and bureaucracy and studies while we're not actually listening to the stories and, uh, and holding that as truth. It's such a weird practice. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. You got the questions and the answers really. And you know, I don't, I think you know, there's a couple of groups that I want to lift up that are here in Minnesota. So Trust Project, um, Trust Minnesota. So they're a newly formed group. They've been here for a few years. And, um, and it was started by queer women of color. And, you know, their, their framework is reproductive justice. And so, you know, one of the things, and this is not, you can't attribute it to me, you know, when people have talked about, well, there are no, I'm not being asked to sit at the table. And then, you know, someone said, well, you know, make room for yourself at the table. Well, there are no chairs at the table. Right. And then someone said, well, you need to bring your own chair. And so we're not always going to be invited to the conversations. Um, and sometimes we're excluded from the conversations. And again, it's, there's a lot of courage in stepping up for what you believe in and sharing your stories and sharing your experiences. And we don't always have that at, at any given moment. And there are days where I'm tired and I'm like, I can't do that today. And then other days where I'm like, no, I have to do that because I've got to bring somebody else with me. And I think it's about bringing other people with you. So when I look at sort of the folks that are here, if you came with somebody else, you know, I, I applaud you. If you came by yourself, I applaud you. But we have to bring more people to the conversation. That's how we shift and that's how we change because when we can shift this conversation when we can you know back to your point when we can take back the narrative and you know claim our voice um, but trust project is one of these groups um, Melissa Kwan who couldn't be here with us today you know I mean she has been a leader in NAPOV which is the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum and you know that group started because their voices weren't being heard right when we look at the population of Minnesota Minnesota is 14 percent people of color and so you know, folks are like, oh, Minnesota's a very, you know, the cities, we'll start with the cities. The cities, Minnesota cities are very diverse. Yes and no, you know, so when you talk about having conversations and lifting up what we believe we need to have, you know, as far as uh, policies and rights in our community, it's challenging when you're typically, um, you know, I don't like to use this word, but a, a minority or, you know, someone who's not represented. And so I think, you know, there's going to be, we're going to continually battle with this. It's going to be, the discomfort is going to be high. The tensions are going to be high. And we have to be okay sitting in that. We're not going to leave here today resolved. And we're not going to all walk out hand in hand singing Kumbaya. I don't know if, so this is me, a prejudice. Do all the young people know Kumbaya, what that means? I said it to my kids and they're like, mom, I have no idea what, what you're talking about. But um, so see, that's my own prejudice and bias that so, um, so I think it's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. You know, as you were saying that question, my heart was racing and I looked across the room and I saw people putting their heads down. And, you know, so it, it is it's challenging, right? Because we're talking about ourselves. We're talking about our basic right to live. And when those things are challenged, there's discomfort. So I think we just have to keep doing it. it, it it's, it's, it's not an easy task, but we have some great groups. But I know there's other questions, so I want to make sure people can ask their questions. All right, we have time for one last question, and then we'll continue the conversation, clearly, in the, in the times to come. So go ahead. Yeah, my question is about how many quantitatively and qualitatively have 
Does your movement include men and of all stripes? Where do they fit in? And where do we make them fit in or help them to fit in? Or be leaders? <laughs> so at Pro-Choice Resources, we have um, three staff at any given time. One of our staff is a white cisgender male. And um, as an emerging reproductive justice organization, I got a lot of pushback and uh, people were angry that I offered that position to this person. And, you know, it wasn't that there were not as qualified folks of color. It was that, you know, I'm going to name Ari was the person for that position. And I think we, it, it's a challenge, right? Because if we don't make space for other people, then those opportunities are never there. But then at the same time, we have to bring everyone along. We have to have those opportunities. So um, you won't find me when I'm talking. You know, I am, I'm not going to put down, you know, males or men. You know, I have a son. I have a husband, my father, my grandfather, my uncles, my brother-in-laws. I'm not going to put them down. But I'm also going to talk about the things that aren't okay that they might be saying. And I think it's at times we need to make – so there's this thing, you know, concept called safer spaces, right? Today, we, we didn't acknowledge that, but we, we wanted this to be a safer space. We can't make it a safe space because things will happen in, in the, in when we're having these difficult conversations. But I think if there is an opportunity, if you can make a space safer for someone so you can acknowledge, you're probably going to hear things where it sounds like we're against you. We're questioning practices that historically your gender has done to folks like me. So I want to acknowledge that, but I'm glad you're here. So I think it's sort of helping people come to the conversations and um, and saying, I'll be here with you while we have this conversation. It might become difficult, but I'll be here with you. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, uh, I, that's one of the ways. I, I think we have, as a movement, the very thing that we're trying to do, we're, you know, that we're trying to erase, we're doing to other communities and we're doing to other folks. So we have to find ways. Um, we can't say we want folks to include us and to be inclusive if the very strategies that we're using are mm -hmm. exclusive. So, you know, I mean, that's a very, that's a simplized way. It's, I, I believe it's more complex, but I, I think we, we need to make it safe for them to come in. But we also, and this goes back to reproductive justice, that they're not the center and they're not the voice, right? Because the whole point of reproductive justice is centering the voice of people of color and people who've been most marginalized and people who face the highest disparities. So that's what the movement is about. But and then are bringing part it back. of that too. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying that, but it, the, the challenge has been that, that they're not holding that center, right? Because if we look at sort of just our history, and I was a history major, that their voice was the center where it excludes. And, and if, you, if you just spend, not even on reproductive health or rights, if you spend two minutes at the Capitol, you will see sort of, you know, I, I, it's, I, have no, I have no understanding of how we can be moving, and we are moving backwards. Make no mistake, we are moving backwards. It, there is a regression and there is a you know, repression of all of our rights. And, and when you look at who holds that majority and the things that are being said, um, you know, I wasn't even referred, you know, a lot of people have heard this story and some people are like, Karen, that's a really old story. But when I first started testifying, I was not referred to by name. My last name is Law. I was in a judicial committee hearing. How hard is that to remember that name? And I was referred, my name was the first name on the agenda and I was only referred to as the African American testifier. So that's what has to change. You know, I. That that's you know so that that's part of the challenge, but I, I think it's not going to be easy, um, and it will continue to be difficult. But bringing people with you, I, I think that's the only way. I like that. I like that, Karen. I'm gonna I'm gonna adopt that. That's like a nice challenge for me. That's really tangible. I should always bring somebody with me. Gosh, I go to so many things by myself. Well, I mean, look, and I mean, like this type of thing, you know, like it's really important. Um, and uh, when it comes to men and um, 
okay, when it comes to men, uh, yes, men are my family and community and uh, patriarchy is a huge part of this and how men show up um, in regards to patriarchy and every space is really important. And, and I think that um, dismantle, like, I, like I, I talk a lot about like dismantling systems and, and like at an individual level, because I find that it has brought me a lot of joy and liberation, quite honestly, like get on the train. It's so great. <laughs> like liberation is such a, uh, an amazing um, thing that has done for my health and mental health and um, and also my relationships. Right. So like I am a queer, pansexual, brown Caribbean person and um, my partner is black, cis, gender and straight. And he's got a lot of guy friends that are dudes that have been um haven't really learned a lot about gender and sexuality but my partner has <laughs> my partner has and in order for us to be in relationship and continue this journey and we just got engaged y'all <laughs> seven years going on um but for him for us to be able to commit to each other like i'm not gonna be with no basic dude <laughs> and like um, and so for him to make the changes that he has named, that he has changed, that have really benefited him as a, a male that has been steeped in patriarchy and white supremacy that he's learned from me has really benefited him and also benefits his friends because he goes back to his friends and talks to his friends about like how transphobia is ridiculous. Um, and, and this is in the black community. This is really important to have those conversations in black community, especially for black men. Um, so yes, they're a part of it. And I, and I've, and I think that I've seen that even like, right. Like I see that in, in RJ movements, like men are, are included, you know, because they have to be just like everybody else does because this is intersectional and it is about where we need to focus though. Right. in the, the, fo the, like we have said over and over again, is that the focus does need to be on the voices that are the most silenced. And men's voices are just not that. Um, just one final thought, because I know we're just about at time. I think when we talk about where where do our accomplices and allies really, or aspiring allies, come into the work, right? Um, we, I, I come at everything through a racialized lens, right? So I, my mom is white, my my family is white. I don't experience the world as a white person. I don't think the world around me sees me as a white person, right? I don't think anybody was like, oh, she white, right? But, um, right, no one did that when they came in. They're like, oh, okay, there's something going on over there. But I, I think about the ways that I navigate the world and navigate racism and the ways that, you know, white folks perpetuate racism, that's real. How I internalize racism is real. And at the very same time, I need those white folks to unlearn that racism because it's still hurting them too. Right, and that's the same for patriarchy and rape culture and you know um and white supremacy right all of these things are connected right so when i talk about like people with penises who identify as men who are cisgender yes they're still impacted by reproductive justice they need to know how to have healthier and safer sex right they need to understand consent they need to understand and have relationships with their bodies that are not embedded in toxic masculinity right they need to be able to understand what are the ways that they show up in the world and can actually be my accomplice, right? And so there have been folks who identify as cisgender men who are at the table, and I'm like, yes, thank you for being here, because you know what you did? Instead of you talking, you said, actually, Heather has something to say, and I'm gonna elevate her voice, right? That's what that's what I need to happen versus a man um, who's really well-intended talking over me and telling me what I need to do with my body and passing legislature and approving legislature that says whether or not my body has value. Right, and so I think that, that qualitatively, quantitatively, they're there, the good people are there, we always have good people, and we have people that sometimes are really well-intentioned and just do some not so great things. And so I think that when we think about reproductive justice through an intersectional lens, we're all at the table, and sometimes certain people just need to be at the table more than others in that moment, right? And so it's, it's a fine balance, and we're always gonna be working on it because you know that same you know man may actually be someone who's a trans man who's also queer, and like navigating things that I will never navigate as a cis woman.
right? And so we can talk about that. And so I think, you know, what we'll end with today is that, you know, something that you said, actually, Jackie, is that my liberation is bound with other people's liberation, right? And we need to be able to access and we need to be able to have these hard conversations because this is hopefully just the beginning and we need everyone here. We need everyone at the table. Reproductive justice, reproductive justice is about equity. It's a public health issue. And we need to make sure that the people in this room and beyond are informed about what they can and can't do with their bodies and who's telling them that they can't, right? We are people in relationship and we're in community. So as we move forward, I hope this gives you some food for thought. I hope that you agreed and disagreed and maybe there's some dissonance deep within and it was a critical conversation for you all. Um, and we hope that you join us for the next critical conversation. So thank you to our panelists. Can we get them just, if you're able to, a round of applause. Thank you. Y'all are rad. Um, and have the rest of your day, y'all. Um, we'll be up here just for a few minutes and then um, we will continue with our Friday. So TGIF, enjoy. Bye. <laughs>